Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Masson. I'm the interim general manager for the Aperio Foundation. Um, I took over for Ian about a year ago, and um, it's been great to get to know the community and all the projects. And this is my first Open Aperio event on this side. I presented a few times, and I'm very excited for the event. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the planning committee who did amazing work, as well as uh, Jen Cummings and uh, Kathy Acevedo, who um, will be helping today and have really uh, guided the whole project. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them from years past of great uh, support of the Aperio Foundation and community. Um, I'd also like to thank our um, sponsors, uh, Blindside Networks, uh, EDF, uh, Longsight, and Unicon. Um, without the support of our community and, and um, uh, commercial affiliates, uh, we wouldn't able, be able to do uh, a lot of the things that uh, make the Aperio community um, uh, so valuable to all the projects and the people involved. So thank you to them for their support. Of course, I'd like to thank our presenters and the contributors to the conference as well. Uh, we have so many great uh, sessions this year around not only the Aperio projects, but how those projects are integrated uh, with institutions and campuses and highlighting the value of open source. Uh, so thank you to everyone. And of course, I'd like to thank you all for coming today, the broader open source and Aperio and higher ed communities. Um, uh, the insights, the collective knowledge, the uh, engagement and enthusiasm um, of this community is amazing. Um, I can't think of a group that's more inspiring, those who are dedicated to community development efforts and, and free and open source software, and not only open source, but um, uh, open content, open data, all the things associated with higher ed. Um, it's really a great group to work with. And thank you all for your, for your continued participation. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stephen Jacobs. Um, Stephen is, uh, the director of Open at RIT, which I think um, is what could be called the OSPO, the Open Source Program Office at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. He's also a professor with the School of Interactive Games and Media. And um, I believe he was part of also um, one of the first, or maybe the first, at least in the United States, um, academic programs, degree programs uh, for free and open source software, free and open source software and culture, I believe is the full name. Um, definitely made headlines when it came out and I can th I think serves as a model for the integration of open source development models and uh, academic programs uh, on a, at a university. Um, he's an inter interdisciplinary scholar who works in several different areas that often uh, overlap, including, as I mentioned, the free and open source software and free culture program, uh, digital humanities, game design and history, and interactive narrative. Um, his open work has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, UNICEF, uh, the All Children Reading Grant Challenge, the Zero Project, the Linux Foundation, Red Hat, uh, Northern Telecom, AT&T. So if you need money, I guess you should talk to Steven. Uh, Stephen is a member of the To Do Group. Uh, folks aren't familiar with To Do Group. They're an industry group that's uh, helping to develop OSPOs within uh, organizations. It might be of value for you if you're interested in that on your campus. Um, he's also a, a member of the OSPO Plus uh, Plus, the Chaos Value Working Group. Chaos is an organization that helps assess the maturity of open source software and development. Um, so without any more, I'd like to introduce Stephen and thank you, Stephen, for uh, meeting with us and sharing your work. Hi, folks. Um, thank you as an audience for putting up with our challenges of technology today. I'm actually calling in via the phone and my video camera seems to be going between freeze frame and live. So the image may not be live, but here I am in my glorious hotel room. So Patrick, if you'd be so kind as to hit the next slide. Um, all right, so I am currently the director of Open at RIT, which serves a bunch of different functions. Like Patrick said, it's uh, an open source programs office. And for those of you who aren't familiar with them, they're an industry construct that supports open source within an enterprise. They come, they, they do a variety of different things, including dealing with compliance issues, training their employees on how to participate in open source, ensuring that 
open source work that they do is compliant across licenses, releasing open source work out into the world from the companies. They do a bunch of different things. Uh, in the last two or three years, starting with Johns Hopkins, these have started to pop up in academia. Um, Hopkins was the first in the U.S. We were the second in the U.S. There's now about six or eight and more coming. Many of the early ones were funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. There are also some out in Europe and elsewhere. That's some of the work we do. We try to be a center of gravity for open work in academia. So our best practices and policies and playbooks and grant support that we do for our faculty, we're also able to do for other universities and nonprofits. So we try to do that work. Um, we do our own research. We both do traditional kind of um, qualitative research on how open source is working within communities, and we do applied research and development as well, most particularly a package called Mystic, which is developed in a very alpha stage at the moment to help uh, faculty explain to their universities how their open work um, has the impact and translation you need to get your annual evasion and your promotion and your tenure and things like that. And then we also do pedagogy. So we sit on top of the courses, the academic minor and the immersion, which is a set of three courses rather than five that's kind of unique to RIT that we offer to our students. So we do a little bit of everything. And uh, next slide, please, Patrick. So we're talking about value, and I'm, I'm particularly interested, what drew me to open source uh, was really a, a question of value. I'm really a film professor going horribly wrong, and I'm now a professor in a, one of the largest colleges of computing doing games. But what got me into open source was, for those of you who remember it, the One Laptop Per Child project, which was kind of the progenitor of the netbook across industry. It was dedicated to um, developing world educational applications. It was a project out at MIT. And I started to have my students build educational games for that platform in those communities. And so the values of being open were what really attracted to me. We hit the dictionary. Value gets used as all of these categories you see there monetary worth, fair return, utility or importance, and principles or quality. And a lot of values are embedded in being open overall. And if we can go to the next one, Patrick. Um, so all of these types of values are kind of embedded in open source and open work in academia, right? And we've got these high level categories of the actual cash, the values and how the entity values the work that's done. And we're going to dive into those in depth in the next couple of slides. Patrick, can you please? All right. So honestly, in the world, a lot of the things that attract people to be participating or taking advantage of open work is the cash right, that it's generally lower cost or even free, and therefore there's a savings there. So there's less hard cash put out, and that often is what first attracts people. In fact, the entire term open source evolved out of the confusion around Richard Stallman's creation of the free software um, movement and the confusion between free in terms of being free from intellectual property restrictions versus free being you don't have to pay for it. And industry then moved away from the term free software to open source software. And in Europe and in other places, you'll often see it referred to as Libre software, which you know is liberated so that we're not talking about the financial value, we're talking about the fact that it's not restricted by IP licenses. So that's where the, the open source and the financial piece comes from to begin with. Um, there's a debate about whether you really save time. Do you save staff time in um, moving from open to proprietary stuff? Um, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes there's not as much features there, that's an issue for people who are used to a 
more commercial projects with a larger base. Um, the power of open source is that you can customize the software to your work and what you want to do. The downside is that you can customize it. And so therefore you're putting time and energy into doing it and sometimes you fall down this rabbit hole. Ideally, you're also investing in the true collaboration involved in open source and you're actually having your community, your employees contribute back upstream to the main project and therefore they're investing time in doing stuff to make the product better, to make it more sustainable, to share your customizations with other people. And this is again in industry, you actually have in the open source program offices, you have entities like Google, Facebook, Amazon, hiring people to work full time on the open source project they didn't originate because their stack depends on them. So true collaboration means that you're also often putting more staff time than you would with a proprietary project because you can't do anything with it. So there's a trade off there. Uh, next slide, Patrick. So kind of the, the spiritual moral values of collaboration, right? When you decide to release something open as a creator, you're making a choice, right? You're not just putting it out there in the public domain and saying, I made this thing, I've washed my hands of it, do whatever you want. Or here it is, I've released it freely and do whatever you want. You're saying by putting it out there in the open, you're encouraging collaboration, you're encouraging teamwork, you're encouraging dialogue. And that's a big value that's held by people who work in any kind of open work, whether it's software, whether it's open science, open data, whether it's open educational resources, right? The, the ability not just to take something and modify it for yourself, but to actually contribute back. And along with that comes community, right? Building a community around the work, either to improve the work itself like you know, here's my education, like here's my lecture set, or here's my software and let's all work together to make it better or stronger versus, or in addition to in science where we're looking to actually validate the work, right? In some aspects, in fact, in discussing this with my university president a while back, and he said, well, science has always been open. You're always supposed to be able to replicate the results to validate that the science actually works. And we had this conversation in which true open science goes much farther beyond that, where you're actually publishing your research plan and where you're trying to build this active community working together. We see this most recently, of course, in the, the universal reaction and research around COVID, right? People sharing their research results immediately so they could be validated, replicated, and we could get to the vaccines we've gotten to. It's a big piece of open science. Um, next slide, please, Patrick. A big challenge in both industry and academia right now is how do we value it? If you put on your, if you will, your, your, your CEO of Amazon hat, right? you know that all of your work relies on some work that's open source. So you know that you kind of need to be an active contributor, an active collaborator. But how do you justify it down beyond the moral principle and the need, right? How do you figure out, well, what's, what's the return on it, investment? How do we know that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck in the way we're doing this, right? How do we do analytics? How do we do metrics? How do we figure it out? And this is a conversation being had in industry over the last couple of years. If you're an academic, right now we see first with climate change and now with COVID, we see a huge amount of emphasis on research work, science, even our educational work being made open, being made shareable. At this point in time, almost all of the funders of research 
whether it's federal or state or foundation, require that the work be open. And in the past, <clears throat> in the first pass of, say, the NIH and the NSF work, um, we see that they said, well, please just make it open. And now we see eight years, 10 years later, especially most recently with the NIH uh, new data policy, it's not just put it up in a folder somewhere where people can look at it. They're being very specific about making sure that it's understandable, relatable, it's maintained, that even before you do the research, when you're doing the initial grant, you've already defined how the data is going to be shared, what the formats are in, how people can access it, how you're going to continue to keep it live after the funding runs out. So there's a very big effort. Well, that trickles down to tenure and promotion, right? The classic tenure and promotion model is that, you know, you have to get your peer-reviewed published articles. But a lot of the work in open science or open software or open education is about doing the things you do to maintain an active community, right? So if you're the person who is in charge of running the community that keeps critical science or critical software alive, like the Human Genome Project back when it first started, or any of the scientific software that people use today, um, if one of your roles is managing that community, working with that group, that doesn't end up in a peer-reviewed journal. Maybe it shows up in a peer-reviewed conference presentation, but maybe it doesn't. And with all of the, not only the funders and the foundations, but organizations like the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, really stressing that everything needs to be open, you see this push that how we promote, evaluate, tenure faculty and researchers needs to be adapted, that we need to find ways in which we can assess how this work is being done, if people are doing a good job, what their impact is, what their translation is, right? It's very easy if you're looking just at software engineering to see how the software and the code base has been changed. But how do you, how do you evaluate and get the metrics for this work that's crucial to the communities around open work. Next slide, please, Patrick. So there's a lot of places where this is being discussed right now, and these links should all be live and active. So within industry or within specifically industry and software engineering, open source software, the to-do group is a group under the Linux Foundation that is composed primarily of um, the open source officers or the people who work in the open source offices of not just the software community, but because everything runs via open source. Now you've got the automotive folks, um, public health, all these entities that use different open source software, they're all involved and they're all beginning to get open source offices just like academia. So discussions are going on there. I'm the first academic who's on the steering committee of the to-do group and they're starting to ask about these issues around academia and open source. Patrick mentioned the CHAOS community. CHAOS stands for Community Health Assessment of Open Source Software. This is a group that gets together to create these analytics and metrics and run dashboards so that you can, if you're looking to contribute to a group of people working on a particular set of software in a particular area that you do work in, is this a good group to work with? Or are they really actively maintaining the software? What's their DEI look like? What conferences are they presenting at? You can create the, you, they create these dashboards based on these metrics and you can add your project and see how you're doing. Um, SF DORA stands for the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. And this is a group that for roughly a decade has been trying to push that move away from just peer reviewed articles being the main way in which we assess people's research. They do case studies, they, they provide recommendations, and last year they got 
million dollar grant from one of the foundations that's interested in open science to create dashboards to do metrics on how well a university is broadly doing assessment. Um, the Helios Open Group is a new group under the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. They've been running a roundtable on open academia. They've published um, guidelines and boilerplate documents on how to be able to work with your university to make it more open. And the Helios Open Group has started this year. It's up to 77 universities, all the way from R1s to community colleges and everything in between. This is a group of people who are starting to look at the impact and of, of becoming more open within an academic institution and best practices and ways in which to work with your faculty and your staff to move things forward. It's a group of 77 colleges all of the members have to have been recommended by their president to be part of this group. And most of them are at um, the dean, provost, associate provost, or even the president's level themselves, all trying to move um, academia to function in a more open way. And finally, the last one is a convening that RIT is holding this September 7th through 9th, where we are bringing industry folks, funders, and academics together because I noticed in my 14 so odd years of working in teaching students how to work in the open. And the last two years of doing that for our faculty and our staff and working with other academics, I noticed that industry and academia are having these same conversations in different ways about how do we how do we work better, how do we do metrics, how do we support and value the work that our people working in the open are doing. So these are all places that you can either get involved in directly or get online and see what's happening. The Stu Group has a public channel. The Chaos Community is fully open. SF Dora is fully open and they're publishing their roadmap on developing these um, these tool sets to the web. They're having open working groups that people can join to join the discussions. Um, and then our summit is open for registration now. The only one that's kind of closed is the Helios Open Group, but they'll be publishing regularly. And if your university hasn't joined that effort, you might want to talk to your president or your administration about getting involved with it. And with that, uh, the next slide says questions. So the floor is open. All right, let me turn off my slide sharing or screen sharing. And uh, can everyone hear me, I assume? Yes. Um, if, folks want, if folks want to type a question into the uh, public chat, I'm happy to um, draw it to Stephen's attention. Or um, if you would like to, I think you can raise your hand or blurt out <laughs> your question. Um, I'll start, though, um, uh, taking the... Uh, privilege of moderator, <clears throat> excuse me. So Stephen, you said um, you've been doing this for 14 years with the last two years uh, uh, specifically around uh, faculty, helping faculty and the administration. Um, it's gonna take every campus 14 years um, and plus two years or including two years of uh, working with their administration to uh, uh, reach this level. Um, what are some of the barriers that you've encountered in introducing working in the open and formalizing um, open source, whether it's software use, development, or open educational resources, whatever it might be, open. Um, what are some of those barriers? And then what have been some of the more successful um, methods, solutions that you've used to gain adoption, well, interest and adoption uh, at RIT? All right, so that's a multifaceted question, Patrick. I'll try to answer piece of quickly. First, 12 of those 14 years were in growing that program to teach students, going from one class to two classes to 
a co-op and internship program to building the five course minor. So the, the faculty and culture change focused work has only been in the last two years. And our first stab at that was when we got our grant from the Sloan Foundation, a lot of that money went to a fellowship program. And so it's, it's very typical for when faculty get mini grants, for example, you know, okay, here's eight grand to hire a student to help you rework your website this semester, right? That's typical. And both the Sloan Foundation and we were interested in taking a model that we had where we were running teams of students to work with, um, with NGOs, right? We did a lot of work with UNICEF and some other folks. And the Sloan Foundation said, we'd like you to take that model inside and start offering faculty the services of a team to accomplish a certain goal. And in general, that wasn't help them build their next generation of their software. It was help them make their research more open. Either it's something new that they haven't put out in the open, so, or it's, it's, well, we've gotten this far and we are open, but how can we grow adoption? So rather than being a technical services software engineering support group, we are through that fellowship program, basically a getting you ready to build a better open community service or let's improve how you do your communications to your community. So in many ways, it was a lot more like being um, a communication service group or a digital services bureau than it was a software engineering house. That's one way in which we've helped things. Um, another way in which we've helped things is by not changing policy because policy in universities, as we all know, is a very long road. So to answer these questions, to, to answer the question of how have we changed the culture at RIT, the answer is, well, we've started to try to change the culture at RIT, right? You know, I expect, um, you know, I was asked just the other day how long I expect that it would take to change the culture. And, you know, I said, culture change is slow anywhere. And in academia, it's often even slower because there are so many different groups you have to get approval from. There's so much buy-in. So I said, if I'm successful in three to five years, um, that'll be great. But in the meantime, because we can't on our own decide policy, when you go to our website, the open at RIT link on the first set of the slides is a live link. And if you go to that, um, you'll see we've published playbooks, we've published best standards or best practices for making your work open and not just software, but your data, so on and so forth. Um, we've published a, we, a group of recommendations and readings for people who are trying to make their case for their open work as part of their tenure process or their evaluation. Here are ways in which you can try to promote that stuff. So those are the things that we've accomplished so far. And, and I'm pretty comfortable with where we've gotten with those. Um, Jim asks, what is the typical staffing in an OS programs office? Hmm. Um, so within industry, uh, those, the heads of those offices generally historically report to the CTO of the entity. And often the people who have been heads of that organization um, come from the software engineering side. Though so that's changing. They're, they're more and more coming from people who have been open source community managers. On the academic side, it's still too early to say. Um, if we take a look at, at how universities are dealing with open science and open data, it really depends on the university. It, it, it goes to scale. At MIT, MIT said to each college, you know your area, you figure it out. You do your own stuff. Um, in this Helios group, you'll see that um, probably 50% of the people who are members, i.e. the designee 
for their university by their president are out of the library. That the libraries is the place where the open access publishing work has been done, often in universities. They're the lead on this effort. Um, so it's it's kind of broad, Jim. I'm, I'm sorry there's not uh, an easy answer to that. We're, we're still too early to decide the typical staffing. Um, basically, within my office, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. And then I hire staff who are more technical, but also have experience in open source community. Um, I see Patrick has one more question. So what you need, Patrick? Oh, I was putting it out there for anyone else who had a question to go ahead and put it in the uh, chat there. Oh, oh, got it. That wasn't your question. Um, All right. So folks? anyone else? The floor is open. A couple more minutes. Um, Jim, right. can um, I guess build on, uh, to, to build a little bit on Jim's question kind of on the side, um, one of the things that I consider a success point with us is that once we got started, um, the the new um, associate provost for our IT unit has been having monthly meetings with us to try to figure out how, on that side of the house, they can be more open and we can be a resource for them and vice versa. So I think that's that's been a great relationship that started. But you know these these things take time, and let's be honest. The last two years, everything takes longer. The last two years, we're all struggling with budgets. We're all struggling with the impact of just delivering our academic process and 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 supporting our students and trying not to burn out our faculty and staff. So everything's slower. But the tide is definitely coming, and, and I'm especially interested in finding the ways in which. Um, we can broaden how we how we support, evaluate, promote people who are doing this kind of work. Because I'm not a traditional faculty member myself. I don't have a PhD, um, and I do different types of work. Uh, there's a question: what uh, fact, uh, what fraction of uh, R1 schools have an OSPO? And well, uh, first of all, I love the name Lake House Watch Party. I just need to say. Um, so what is the fraction of it's easier just to to rattle off the ones that are doing it right now um trinity in ireland us we're not an r1 we're an r2 hopkins is an r1 um santa cruz i don't know whether they're an r1 or an r2 university of vermont has one um sloan just funded one of the colleges in St. Louis that's definitely not an R1. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a number. There are several others that I know are, are underway that are R1s, but I, I can't talk about them, unfortunately, because they have not officially announced. But the trend is that, that a lot of colleges are looking at it. And I think what's more what what's a better indication is is as I said these 77 schools that are part of the Helios group, and if you go to that website you'll see the list. Um, distracting. Very distracting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, was that a question? Nope, that was uh, the other room opening up. Um, ah, got it. Do you want me to read your bio? Do you want me to so, um, just introduce you? Uh, all right, so we've got three more minutes, I think, Patrick. So we've got time for one more question. If someone else has it, I see Dee is typing. Or is yep. there a chat that I'm not seeing? Um, the, there's a public chat window. I don't know if it's open. It looked, um, I think you're seeing it because you saw the Lake House uh, party watch. Yeah, but I think yeah, if someone's yeah. typing, it just gives a prompt until then. All right, so um, since we are wrapping up, um, the slides are shared, so you can go to the Open at RIT link, and then my email address is here. 
And if you want to follow up, you are um, more than welcome to drop me an email. Um, and I'm glad some of you found it of interest. Uh, well, thank thanks to Patrick and company for giving me the chance. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for uh, more sessions. But I'm hitting the road back to Rochester from Pennsylvania. So. Well, thank you, Stephen, so much for uh, the presentation. It's great. It's inspiring work. I know a lot of the folks on the line here are working at institutions that are um, run the gamut from fully embracing open source to uh, just exploring it. So having this as a, as a reference model is a, a great resource. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, folks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.